Okay, so um, welcome to our next fireside chat. My name is Oko. I'm from Techstars. I flew in from London yesterday to be part of our uh, workshop that we're running uh, with Hub71. We're partnering with Hub71 to support the current cohort of startups, and hopefully we'll be also working on the next upcoming cohorts together too. Uh, part of our program that we run here, we try to host fireside chats with our guests from all over the world that come out to support this program and meet the founders. And today very, we are very lucky because we have our Shirley Romig all the way from New York. And I'm sure you guys, some of you have seen her background, but she's our Chief Accelerator Investment Officer. I got that right. Uh, joining us. Um, she has a vast experience in startup operations and investments, so we're going to be digging deeper into it. Um, but yeah, uh, let's get started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask her questions and we're going to have discussion, but towards the end, I'll open it up so you guys can ask your questions. Um, cool. All right. Hi, Shirley. How are you? Hey, Oko. The, uh, the pressure is on because I just sat in his storytelling workshop earlier, and the gist of that workshop is all about uh, pulling out the emotions in what you say. So... I really have to make you proud. Yeah, you, you'll do fine. Um, how is it? Is this your first time in Abu Dhabi? It's my first time in Abu Dhabi, um, not my first time in the region. Um, I've been to Dubai a few times. Actually, the first time I was in Dubai was in the early 2000s. Um, and, and I spoke to um, various development offices about building up the region. I was uh, at the location of the Palm, I believe, where the world, when they were dredging up the sand back, back over 20 years ago. So it's very cool for me to be back here, um, you know, seeing the development many years later. And this is your first time at Hub 71. What do you think? It's amazing. It's incredible. I want this to yeah. be my office. Can I move yeah. here? Yes. <laughs> awesome. yeah, yeah, we might hold you to that. Um, so Shirley, can you give us a little bit of background, you know, short history of your background? Short history of my background. Okay, I'm pretty old, so uh, middle length history of my background. Um, I grew up in Taiwan, so um, moved here when I was, moved to the U.S. actually when I was nine. My family was looking for a better life, better education. Um, my dad was a, what I like to call rocket scientist, but he was a missile engineer for the Taiwanese military. He went to the U.S. to work for a contractor there. Um, and he started a side hustle business in selling computers in the late 1980s and early 1990s when personal computers were very novel. And so that was my first entrepreneurial experience. I assembled giant computers. I drove my, with my family to all the cities in, in, uh, in the U.S. to sell computers back when they were just coming onto the market. And so that really gave me a sense of what it's like to build a business, um, to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative, to be problem solvers, to be resilient. And so I've uh, tried to spend the next you know, 25 years of my career really living up to that, that early experience, um, which has led me to many different operating roles and building um, businesses across industries um, and to be a co-founder, a CEO of my own startup right before Techstars, and then now being a Techstars. Um, really helping the entrepreneurial journey, knowing how difficult it is. Um, and so it's a full circle for me now to be on this side of the, of the chair, having started out very humbling, assembling, assembling computers in the basement of my family's home in Virginia. Cool. And do you now know what you want to be when you grow up? No, I don't. Um, and I get people ask me oftentimes, and they say, oh, your, your journey is so interesting. Like, how did you... How did you make the jumps? Because I have, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, I've done a lot of different things with a, the through line of all around sort of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and I don't know if we, I don't think I really gave that much thought as to what I wanted to be when I grow up. I think um, some of it is cultural, right? Like growing up uh, in an Asian family, you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or you're a business person. And when they say business person, they typically meant like a CPA or accountant. And I was terrible in accounting, and I just knew I wouldn't cut it. And so I had to kind of figure out what I wanted to be outside of those three things that are approved by my family. Um, I think I have been really fortunate in my career to have met wonderful mentors. I have a really curious person, and so I think the, the combination of being curious, 
the combination of you know hustle and resilience and um, and uh, meeting you know mentors have kind of taken me to where I am today. I'm gonna label you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, what are some labels? Would you say you're an operator for sure? Scale operator is what I think is one. What else do you identify with? Um, I identify. Oh, what do I identify as? Um, so many things. Um, I identify as a consumer tech executive. Um, I ran operations at Lyft, which is kind of the Uber of, I, hate, I can't believe I'm saying this, the Uber of uh, US and Canada. Um, I ran a large book of business at Equinox, which is a uh, upscale um, gym. Um, I was an executive at Saks Fifth Avenue, which is a department store in the US. I launched an e-commerce business there. So I would say consumer executive, tech executive. Um, I'm also a board member, so I'm on the board of two public companies in the US. Um, I'm also on a personal level, I'm a mother. I have two kids who are awesome. I'm a huge tennis fan, so if anyone wants to talk to tennis, come talk to me. Um, yeah, and I'm an I'm a, I'm a entrepreneur, uh, lifelong advocate and enthusiast. Yeah, Carlos, huh? What? Carlos. He's not my favorite. No? No. No. I, I mean, I know he's unstoppable now, yeah. and it's kind of in, like incredible how he moves, but, you know. I'm talking I, about tennis, by the way. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was trying to figure out questions for you and trying to pick uh, experience from your history, and you have really rich history, I couldn't pick because they were all, I think they all have different, you know, uniqueness and cool journeys for you. But which one of those kind of makes you feel proud and why? Oh, well, that, that is really simple. I actually just posted something on LinkedIn about this today. Um, I am a really proud of being a, a co-founder and CEO of a startup called Mixo. Um, it didn't have the longest life, I have to say, but it is equally the most exhilarating uh, career experience to date and also the most devastating. Um, exhilarating because um, you know I have this sort of family thread in entrepreneurship. Everything I've done is in service of building and growing businesses. Um, and to be able to do that from a zero to one startup was, you know, you're building everything. I was the fundraiser, I was the recruiter, I was the, um, you know, room scheduler, like everything, right? You, you guys know you're doing it right now. Um, and to be able to make connections all over the world. So our business was a content creation platform for food, for the food vertical. And so we built a you know, base of creators from all over the world and to be able to connect with them and talk to them about their journey and why they're excited to come to us was a dream come true. Um, but it's also you know, really, really, really hard at the same time um, because startups are hard and you have to be really crazy to do it. But that combination is um, just the most um, rewarding experience in my career to date. Um, but it's funny because now I look back and I think to myself, one day I'm going to jump back into that zero to one seat. It's kind of like maybe people harder for this, this audience to, to, to understand, but again, back to the mother, you know, like having a child is so difficult. It's like crazy, right? If you actually think about it. But then after you have a child, you're like, oh yeah, I'll have another one. Even though it was just like a really terrible and painful experience for all females who go through it, you're like six months there, yeah, like, I'll do that again. Cause like how else is human race gonna continue and you totally forget about all the hardship or the like early hours and the feedings and all the stuff because you love it. And that's, that's how I feel about um, being a startup founder. I guess that's the closest men can get to. Yeah, yes, maybe that's why there are so many male founders here. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to understand, you know? We're trying to empathize. Um, when you started this startup, before that, what were you doing? Yeah. Um, so before that, I spent 20 years uh, over a few chapters of my life, early chapter in management consulting. So I was one of the very early earliest people sort of bringing the traditional companies onto the digital age. So starting in the 2000s, right before the dot-com crash, um, I helped uh, student loan companies, insurance companies, uh, consumer companies get online. 
Um, and then I went to um, Saks Fifth Avenue, department store in the US, and I helped launch an e-commerce business there, and I worked very closely with Saks.com. Um, sort of second part of my career, I then went to become uh, like in-house operator, if you will. Um, that's when I went to Equinox and I ran a um, $450 million business um, across all the different businesses inside of Equinox. So things like personal training, food and beverage, retail, spa, kids club, all the kind of varying businesses there. Um, and then I was at, at Lyft running operations for eastern part of the U.S. and Canada, which meant um, managing the driver life cycle from the beginning to the end. We had about 2 million drivers on our platform. And so everything from recruiting, retaining, regulatory issues, um, all the experiments that we ran in, inside that kind of driver supply business. And then I also had two other businesses that I ran um, inside of Lyft, which is a uh, rental business, because a lot of drivers actually don't drive their own vehicles, and then a vehicle maintenance business. After that, I went to do a startup. Do you think you were prepared? For the startup? Yes. No. I thought I did. I mean, I was like really old at the time. <laughs> even older after I left. I worked over 20 years before I went to the startup. Um, and I know, I don't, I think you can mentally prepare yourself for something, but then until you get into it, you have no idea. But I bet, you know, all those experiences coming from oh, consultant yeah. background, yes. right? And then being able to manage Lyft. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the clarification. I think from an intellectual standpoint, from a skill set standpoint, no problem. Like I, I knew how to get, you know, construct a go-to-market strategy. I knew how to network. I knew how to build a financial model. I was our accounting and finance team. Um, all that was simple. The hardest part for me was really about um, getting knocked down and getting back up again, like 50 times in a day. That was, that was the hard part. No safety net anymore. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, when, when you, uh, did you think that you were gonna basically take what you've learned in the past and it was gonna be easy transferable to the startup world when you were building your venture, so to speak? Um, yes, yes. I was kind of naive, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to me, I, um, because of the consulting experience of just having run large businesses, I said, listen, I have this mental model, right? I could easily see the future. Um, the, businesses I w the business I wanted to build was a global platform um, to, to unlock um, uh, food transactions. And I could see the building block of how I, we would get there. So yes, that, I think that was the easy part. I think the hard part is actually doing it, right? <laughs> so. so based on that experience, yeah. what you've seen kind of post-mortem, what role do you think now you should play in a startup? Um, I am in the perfect seat now. I am really happy to be where I am. Yeah. 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 What seat do I think? Um, this is the perfect seat, right? I think I've said earlier that I've come full, full circle. This is a seat where I can leverage that operation experience um, the, the, the empathy for founders um, to be able to support our startup community. The reason I'm digging into this is because even today I met two people who are now doing that switch from corporate world to finally you know, deciding to start their own business. What would you tell them now? I'd say do it. I think for the pe for people who are true entrepreneurs and founders, um, and I don't know, am I pretend one, am I real one, I don't know, but what I know in my heart of hearts is that if I had not done this, and I will do it again from a zero to one perspective, it, to me, it's like I don't wanna live with any regrets. It's something that is so important and um, mission driven, like on a deep personal level, that if I didn't do it, I would always regret it, and I don't want to live that way. And so for the people who found their way to the corporate side and now are finding their way to the entrepreneur side, it's awesome. Like, do it at any age, you know? I think if I were to go back to an earlier, younger version of myself, I would say do it when you're 25. Um, but do it when you're 35, 45, 55. Like, it doesn't matter. Just, just come. It's, 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 ama it's, it's amazing. Um, entrepreneurship and startups is what 
is what changes the world, um, not the Fortune 500s. What, what skill would you say you were, uh, you kind of alluded to it earlier, but I want to get a black and white answer. So like, what skill do you think you need or those people would miss if they did that conversion, moved over to a startup world? Wait, uh, let me clarify the question. What skills do I think I do you need? People coming from corporate background, yeah. they have all these other experiences. Yeah. What is that one skill that they might want to really harness or you know, improve on when they make that switch? Yeah, I think it's resilience and grit. I, I, I think that skill, number one, two, three to 10 for startup founders, um, because you have to really believe in what you're doing and you have to work so, so, so hard at it and you're going to get knocked down so many times. It's about constantly coming back um, and that takes a really special um, depth of mental grit that you have to really dig into. And so you can learn all the hard skills in the world, but that's, that's you know, kind of like table stakes, right? You can, you can learn that off of YouTube anywhere, um, but that sense of resilience and grit um, only comes deep inside from one person, and you can't really learn that. Do you think everybody is an entrepreneur? Um, I don't, and that, I think that's okay. I think entrepreneurs are a special type of crazy people. Because right? <laughs> if you like, once you've done it, you're like, oh wow, this is really hard. It, it, it takes it's it's a special it's a special mindset. Um, not everyone's cut out to be an entrepreneur, and that's okay. Yeah, and that little voice starts saying, see, I told you, you're not an entrepreneur. Quit that. <laughs> Get back to corporate. Yeah, it's okay. We need, we need diversity. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So thank you for that. Let's go to um, one of the topics I wanted to uh, dig deeper into today was really taking your operational and global experience and, and what can we learn as founders who are looking into establishing our companies in the secondary market or next markets, right? So um, what do you, would you bring your company here to UAE? I would absolutely. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here. I'm saying that because I think that um, what you're building here is the future. I truly believe in it. I actually made a comment to my husband when I showed up. I said, we should move here at some point and or our kids will definitely spend a good part of their careers here when they're grown. Um, I think that um, there is so much resource, there's so much mindset for innovation um, that is uh, a great foundation for, for startups. When you say those things, I can think of many other ecosystems that can also offer those you know, benefits or... Um what, what makes this one, I guess, unique and different? Yeah, I mean, for this one, it's the speed of execution, right? It's, um, you know, I just learned recently that Hub71 started in, in 2019, right? And look at it. And it's this, uh, this, this singular focus on wanting to go to drive forward, and then you're aligning all of the, the regulatory system, the financial system around that single focus that you actually, it's not that many places in the world that... Um, that has that, right? If I look into my home market in the US, you're constantly swimming up a hill against regulatory issues or government, um, and, and you end up moving really, really slowly, and you end up resorting to lobbying or politics, um, which really is kind of the death of, depth of, death of innovation and in startups. Yep. So let's, know, let's now imagine your startup is still going. You guys are doing great. You decided to go to a secondary market. Yeah. Uh, what's your first step? Secondary markets. Um, I would say that the first thing is um, spend a lot of time doing research. I know that sounds very common sense, but I think that for startup founders, I would say that one of the primary uh, features of your mindset is like a sense of urgency and move fast and speed. That can be pretty detrimental when you're looking at investing in another market because Another feature for startup founders to be successful is focus, right? You only have so much time, you only have so many resources, you only have so many dollars that you can spend. And so if you make a misstep, it's, you know, it's a misstep and you have to figure out how to recover from it. And so I would say take some time to really figure out, A, do you want to go to second mar secondary market? Where is the best secondary market possible? Resist the sort of um, 
temptation to go to a secondary market because you happen to know someone there and it's easy, really make sure it aligns strategically with your, your business. And then I would say be physically on the ground. Um, you know, I use personal example. Um, me joining Techstars is very recent. And if it was really important for me to go to every single one of our markets and look at our programs and see how they're run because you cannot replicate an experience of physically being in there in person um, to build relationships and same with, with your business too. So be there on the ground, hire local teams. Yeah, and a lot of companies, at least when they come talk to me and when they wanna expand to new markets and we run our programs in Japan, US, uh, Saudi and uh, Europe, etc. One of the first things founders ask is, hey, Oko, can you introduce me to some people there? Um, what else should they be asking? Uh, and is that, is that what you recommend they do? Um, yes. I would say that introductions, it's not a direct path. I would say do a lot of research and the introductions, I wouldn't expect it to be like an immediate, let's say, a business deal. It's more about introductions to get more introductions to get more introductions, right? And, you know, kind of bring back to Techstars, one of the power is our network. You know, we have tens of thousands of mentors in our network and, and thousands of, of startup founders. Um, and there's a reason why we have built that network. And so, you know, yes, talk to people. Yes, meet people. But I would say that it's all about... Um, being really strategic about who you meet, what you want to try to get out of that relationship, and what's the next step and the next person you want to meet, and, and kind of like executing the next start of the plan, next step of the plan. When you say doing research and be strategic, those are very vague in yeah. a way. Like, what does that mean, right? Yeah. Uh, and it, it's got to be really hard to foresee that. How do you navigate that difficulty? Yeah, I mean, you only navigate it through mistakes. So if I were to bring back to my, my startup, we had launched um, this really, what I thought was incredible founder tool set to create content super, super fast. So shrinking content creation time from 10 hours down to, to mere minutes. Um, and we launched this content on in the food category, specifically with Korean food. And we did that because in the States, Korean food is having a moment. Uh, we made a mistake by launching a you know, foreign food category without any actual f boots on the ground in Korea. And so when we launched, we had a lot of American Korean food content creators, a lot of you know, content creators from all, all around the world making Korean food, but they weren't native Koreans. And so we missed out on the opportunity of capturing that market actually in Korea because they didn't have any faces that they knew there. Um, so that was a mistake. So I would say, you know, research, had, I, had we done more research looking back at hindsight 2020, I might not have started out in the, the, that particular category. I might have started out with a different category, let's say plant-based foods, right? That's not necessarily country specific. People eat plant-based, people eat multiple meals a day. They may not eat Korean food for multiple meals a day. So like, had I, had I thought more about the strategy, I would have done things differently. So I would say that, that's what I mean by like research and be strategic. We did Korean food because it was having a moment in the US, but looking back, that wasn't the right approach. Plant-based food sounds really good pivot now. Yes, yeah. Right, now would yeah. be really that, good Now would have been good, yeah. Steal that <laughs> idea. It's a really good idea. Um, do, did you notice um, expanding to a secondary market coming from kind of a larger capital foundation versus as a startup, it was different and how you need to navigate that different? What were some interesting, uh, I guess, insights? Um, so if I'm hearing correctly, like uh, having very little resources, how do you uh, navigate versus... Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly harder, but I also think it forces you to be more creative. Um, you know, you can launch in a second, second country, you know, either by spending a ton of money or spending no money. Um, I've seen both. Um, I think that, I think it, you know, forces you to be a lot smarter. You know, it doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money for us to have hired somebody, you know, in that example in Korea. I probably actually 
would have cost us less money to do that um, because we ended up having to pay content creators in more expensive markets rather than in Korea. So I, I don't, I think it's, I, I don't necessarily, yeah, I mean, I guess resources is not necessarily a concern in that, in that case. Follow up. Would you attempt to go to a secondary market after you have secured, you know, enough capital to do that, or would you actually do it uh, in, this, in a similar manner again? Um, I think that, I think it goes back to the idea of focus, right? Like, where do you want to take this business? What is your long-term um, strategic plan? And I know that sounds very counterintuitive to startups to say, like, I'm just trying to survive the tomorrow. Like, what's my long-term strategic plan? But the lack of focus is going to kill a startup. And so um, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's necessarily an issue capital. I would say, do you feel like in your home market or your core market right now that you've got the a number of customers or the milestones or the KPIs that you're, you feel very solid right now? Could you afford to take your eye off that business? And if you can't afford to take your eye off that business and have that business still be growing at the speed at which you expect of yourself, that your investors expect of yourself, I wouldn't even start looking at a second market. Is product market fit transferable? Oh, that's a very general, hmm. Can you take your original product market fit in your own home country and just assume that secondary market, it will just go as is? I mean, yes and no. I think, I think um, to take the right share business um, as an example, yes, in the sense that Generally, do people need to be transported? Yes. Can we disrupt the taxi system all over the world? Yes. But what's not transferable is like all the regulatory issues in those specific markets. Those you have to reinvent in every market that you go to. Even in the cities that at Lyft and what we operated in, one city is very different from another in terms of how we recruited drivers, how we pay drivers. There are always local nuances, even at the city level, let alone country level. Um, and so, yes, the general idea may be, but the execution is not transferable. And that, that's, that ultimately would determine the success of that second market. Yeah. And isn't it, is it almost like more costly than to customize your core thing into this new market to fit the nuance rather than almost look at it as this is a brand new market. Maybe we need to look at it as if we don't have PMF there. Wait, can you say that again? Um, is it more costly to try to adjust what you already have into a new market versus mm -hmm. I must look at it as blank slate? Um, well, I don't know if you can really look at it as a blank slate because you have a, a product you're already extending into. I wouldn't actually recommend you build it from the ground up because then it's not scalable. You're always trying to keep an eye on what's scalable, right? Um, so, so I think adjusting is the right approach and that's where the local team becomes really important. Uh, category adjustments, maybe, yeah, when you bring to the new market. When you say category, you mean? So maybe it's the rental business. That's more what, what's needed on that next market versus your uh, taxi hailing or ride sharing. Yeah, yeah, potentially. I think you got to look at all aspects of your business to see which pieces need to be adjusted. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I have this debate all the time with founders. That's why I'm digging into it. Um, hiring people, local. Um, tell us how you would do, who you would look for, uh, what kind of profile would you look for? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, again, depends on the, on the business, but I would say you probably do want to hire a more senior level person to begin with, and you'll have to trust that person to hire his or her team underneath. Um, I, I think that you want to, um, you know, hire people with a... a um, you know, a set of freedoms, but with contingency, right? Um, you know, for me, I'm always thinking about like, what's scalable, what's scalable. And so there's gonna be a part of your business that um, you want it to be a playbook, right? Here's a senior level person, here's my strategic plan. Here's what I, you know, here's what our product is, here's how, what I wanna accomplish. Um, but then you also have to make sure like, that person tells you like, okay, well, here's the reality of the market. Like we need to adjust, a, you know, X, Y, Z, here's the timeline. Here's the type of resources that I, we need. 
Um, but be careful about making like way too many adjustments because then before you know it, you have a collection of markets, none of which are scalable, and that's gonna become, you're familiar with technical debt, this is gonna be your operating debt. And operating debt is very, very expensive. How big was your team when you guys expanded into Korea? Or tried to expand? Oh, I mean, we were a startup, so we had 16 people, we were small. 16 people? Yeah. And at that point, if you had hired with 16 people on your team, would you have, what level would you have hired? Um, I would have hired like a mid to like a mid junior person, right? Somebody with maybe like five to seven years of experience. Okay. Yeah. With equity or? Always with equity. In a startup, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you want to align your incentives, right? Yeah. And are this is this person involved in your original? I guess the core business as a as a co-founder or what's their role? There? Oh no, I think you know your co-founders are are your co-founders at the start of the company. By the time you're extending into secondary market, um, unless there's something extraordinary about this individual, I, I, I would see it hard for that person to be a co-founder level person. You also wanna be careful how many co-founders you have because when you have too many co-founders, that create a lot of issues down the road for your business. Great. You know, you talked about you wanna give them freedom, but then also create parameters around them. And I've seen a situation where the local person will go, oh, you don't understand our market. It's completely different. You gotta change it this way, this way. All of a sudden your product is like com something unique and you're almost starting over, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, the, that's what I said about sort of like operations debt. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I really actually can't replicate this business because I'm building kind of from zero to begin with. Um, so I think it's, it's an art and a science, right? It's an art in the sense that you want to make sure that you're listening to people on the ground who you hired for a reason because they have local knowledge. And so you do want to hear what the feedback of what they're saying. But you can't, and the science becomes, or maybe the art, it becomes, you can't adjust your product so much that it becomes totally unrecognizable. Um, so I think it, that's, that's kind of the, that's, that's, the, that's the crux of what you do, right? As a, as a founder, as a leader, part of your job is to make really high quality decisions. And so when somebody tells you, or even 10 people in, the, in that local market tells you, here's how it is, for a lack of a better word, do you choose to believe them? And what do you believe, right? And so it's a push and a pull. They're gonna wanna push you in one direction, but you have to put your foot down at some point and say, I believe you, that may be true. That is a decision, you know, I'm going to make a decision in a different direction for X, Y, and Z reasons. I know, I know it's gonna be hard in whatever way, but if you think about scalability as, as a goal for your business, you have to know what are decisions that are okay, that's not gonna have operational impacts down the road that hinders your scale, and what are some things that will, and, be, and, and have that point in mind. And is every, all co-founders involved in this sort of test? That is a leadership philosophy question. I think for me, yes. Um, for somebody else, no, right? For me, I think it's important to have the buy-in of your co-founders. And then if you're the CEO, you have to step in and make a, make a decision at the end of the day. Not everyone's gonna agree on everything, but they would at least be brought in on the decision-making process. Yeah, because whoever is involved in that secondary market is gonna have more empathy, more data, and they're gonna be going back and saying, you guys are not understanding, we need to go a little, you know, push more here, et cetera, right? Yeah, but your job of a leader at the end of the day is not necessarily to be liked, right? Your job as a leader is to move your team forward. And so, yes, you wanna listen to people's feedback, and listen, yes, you wanna look at data, and then you have to step back and make a decision. And um, yeah, I guess, I guess the question is, is everyone gonna always like your decision? No. Are you always gonna get it right? No. But that's okay, you just have to really be right more than 50% of the time, right? Um, who plays chess here? Yeah. So I play very little, but my kids play a lot, and they're in tournaments. And their coach always says, you're a championship level chess player if you win you know, over 50% of the time. And if you were to look at Magnus Carlsen, I think he only wins like 60% of the time or something like that. And he's the number one chess player in the world. And so you're gonna make decisions. It's not always gonna be right. But if you're making 
more winning decisions than not, even by a fraction, you're on a good path. Like, kind of think of that, like winning decision and kind of that arc, you know, down. You're heading towards winning. And that's also true in most sports. I think individual sports, to be great in the world, you just need to be a little over the half point or something like that. Um, did you make that decision about Korea? Did I what? Did you make the decision about Korea expansion? Uh, my, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. <laughs> Too late. Um, you know, I, I, my co-founder is Korean, and so uh, I really lean on him as, a, as the subject matter expert. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, he's awesome. We're still good friends and stay in touch. And, but I would probably have made my, my arguments known more forcefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's exactly the point, is that somebody will have a little more conviction about that decision. And in their mind, like you said, it's right, and it's their decision. And so, you know, the question is, how do you balance that amongst each other? How do you, how do you make sure you help each other uh, correctly when, when, when it's time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think of building trust um, and... You know, so many startups break up because of co-founder fit issues. Um, you know, I was really lucky. My co-founder is very different from me from a skill set perspective. Also, he's a he is a chief product officer by nature. Um, we had a lot of trust and um, you know respect for each other's skill sets. Um, that was not the right decision, but other decisions he made were great. So, <laughs> great. All right, we hired, we did a research, we decided this is a good time to go into secondary market. We hired a junior, senior person, right? Junior level uh, person. You give them freedom. What's the next step? Well, freedom with contingencies, right? Freedom, but you know, generally you gotta stay in these lanes. Um, what's next? Um, what's next is I think really clear um, KPIs that person has to hit. Um, very clear um, directions on timing and, um, you know, set your team up for success. So what does that mean? You know, in the home market, helping them build local relationships, making sure that person has the resources um, that they, they need to go run with that. You know, whether it's, you know, in this case, it's a content creator business, making sure that person has a budget, um, to, to go out and recruit content creators. And how are you balancing that in terms of KPIs at home market versus this, right? Resource allocation. Um, so how much money would I like allocate to that part of the business? Sure. Um, to hit my KPIs. I mean, I would, I would look at what KPIs I need to hit in order to figure out how much I, I want to allocate. And this kind of goes back to your question about like, would you want to save up a pool of capital first before you go to a secondary market? I would assume, you know, this is a hypothetical scenario now, but like I would assume that you have to actually have the money in order to invest in that secondary market before you actually go there. If you're barely maintaining in your home market and you're in that secondary market, you know you're, you need to pull back right away, right? That's, that's yeah. You said earlier Lyft is in US, Canada? US and Canada, yeah. US and Canada. That was surprising to me. I thought Lyft was in more countries. Oh, thanks. No, we weren't. <laughs> Do you think they should be? You know, it's funny. Uh, the founders recently said, so they recently stepped down. Um, first time outside CEO in, in like 10 years in the company's inception. They recently have said, yes, you know what, we should have er invested earlier to go into other countries because when Uber really expanded into, er into other countries at the time, um, it was seen as a little bit of a silly strategy from a Lyft perspective because we felt like there was so much space to grow still inside of the US. Um, but I think that clearly Uber did the right thing in extending out into more countries. That said, you know, they also had a lot of pitfalls, right? They had to pull out of China, um, so there were issues along the way, not to say it's perfect, but um, yeah, I think that their earlier, um, the earlier investment into outside countries did pay off for Uber, and Lyft should have done that earlier. Was it the original team of Uber? I actually 
curious, was it the original team of Uber who made with that, uh, went with that expansion or was it? Yeah, it was uh, under Travis Kalanick's okay. direction, yeah. So this is a real good example of two founders making two different decisions, right? One is taking a bet on the expansion and going, uh, looked problematic, but it turned out really good versus another one who says, no, our two markets are more important and let's not go beyond. Yeah, because what happened is in that kind of business, and that's a, bus that's a scale business, once you waited too long, it became way too expensive because um, you know, to win over a market for that particular business just got very expensive. So for example, when we went to Canada, um, you know, we're in Toronto and we're in Vancouver, and when we launched Vancouver, I think we spent something like $20 million just on marketing. And, but that's because by that time, you know, Uber was already in the market. And so you had to build a brand recognition, right? If you had gone in as the first, first brand in that market, it would have been much cheaper for us. You said something, that's a scale business, you said. Is there no scale business or what do you mean by that? That's a scale business. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's a scale business, meaning that um, you can only have a rideshare business when there's a lot of users and a lot of drivers, right? It's not a, it's not a, it's not a business that you can start with like 10 customers. You got to really go big and go home or go home. And so that's why it became really expensive for us to go big when we were the second player into the market. Would you do economy of scale for your startup? Would you go for that kind of business now or...? Um, I mean, not necessarily. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of beauty in in businesses that don't require that many quote customers. If I start a new business, I don't think no offense, but I don't think it would be in the B two C market anymore. Building consumer businesses are really expensive, and I and I spent over twenty years building consumer businesses. Building a brand is really expensive, and I. I think I underestimated that. And building a brand takes a really long time. And I think I underestimated that also because I'd always, you know, leading up to it, worked for businesses that had, that had extraordinary brand recognition. Um, so no, I would actually go to a B2B business. If, you, if you're in a B2B business, then good on you. You, you. you chose the right path. Great. Is there anything I didn't ask you about scaling before I open it? to the floor, or you wanted to cover? I can't think of anything right now. Great, did a good job. All right, I'll open it up to you guys. Question, yes. So how do you see generative AI can add value here in the content generator or e-commerce industry where you are play, play in? Yeah, uh, such a good question. I actually was just thinking about this the other day. I thought, Wow, I mean, if I were still in that business, my entire model would have changed, right? In a way, it would actually have been much cheaper for me to create, to build that business. So all the things that people are saying about how you can build startups with much fewer people, much cheaper is true because if I were building that business today with the explosion of generative AI, just really in like the last 12 months, um, yeah, instead of paying hundreds of content creators, I could have just generated the content myself, so. <laughs> so what type of, of content you will generate with AI? Just to want curious, what are you gonna do with it? Like now, is it the, the, the tools is there, what you can add value with it? What, what, can, what can I add value with it? In that case, the value isn't necessarily in, so the, the tool that we had created is a tool that allowed content creation to be shortened, right? So that part of the tool really kind of becomes not valuable necessarily anymore with the, with the generative AI piece of the, the business. Um, in that case, I would pivot to um, really brand building and, um, and acquiring users. Yeah, I was trying to acquire content creators and users at the same time in a two-sided marketplace. Two-sided marketplace businesses are really, really hard to build because you're trying to like generate heat here and generate heat there. In this case, I really, you know, in the future, I only have to generate heat from a user perspective and not the content creator perspective. You're cutting, kind of cutting off 50% of your problem. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what would you think about the trends five years from now? in startups? Like what would be the, the biggest industries that would be impacted by building startups? Okay, biggest industries that would be impacted by building startups. 
or the or where do I think startups would be five years from now? Yeah, I mean, uh, how would startups impact industries five years from now, and what what would be the industries? I don't see any industry that will not be impacted by startups, especially with where how fast AI is moving, right? We're sort of on this curve where like AI's been around forever, decades, right? But we're we're just in this like crazy up and to the right vertical growth right now. And I can't think of a single industry other than true like hard labor, like a roofer or like, you know, a massage therapist where you literally have to use your hands. I can't think of a in single industry that isn't going to be disrupted by startups. I guess uh, to double down on that question, which is where are tech stars investing in right now moving forward? Um, yes, good question. So we, we are diversified um, investment in early stage startups. We invest in all, you know, all, all um, industries, particularly in healthcare, financial services, um, future of work, you know, you name it, we're in it, climate. Um, but, you know, certainly AI is a huge thing of our investment thesis. Uh, when you're hiring, like in the kind of 200 to 300, I mean, apart from mission-driven people, what do you look for? And when things maybe, when you need to cut maybe in a, another stage, what is the kind of driver for that? Is it just unmotivated people or you're pivoting? Or? Sorry, what's the second part of your question about cu cutting? So I guess if you have to scale down again, mm -hmm. um, how do you make those decisions with uh, your talent? Um, how do you hire and how do you scale down? Two-part question. Um, okay, so I'm really passionate about hiring because I think that I am, I am in the mindset, and you'll talk to 10 people and you get different, 10 different answers. I'm of the mindset that I would hire, quote, slower, um, but hire the right people because it is so expensive and so painful when you hire the wrong people and then you have to move them out of your organization. Um, it takes up a ton of emotional energy that you as a founder just like don't have and don't need to have, right? Um, so I would say build a framework, whatever that framework might be for you in terms of hiring and stick to that framework. So for me personally, it's important for me to hire people who are, um, you know, growth mindset, positive attitude and willing to work hard. And then of course have a subject matter expertise that I'm looking for. But if those four things are met, you know, you can do anything with a team like that. In terms of scaling down, um, you know, I worked in retail for the early part of my career and I felt like every year what I did was cost cutting and reducing headcount. And that was incredibly painful. Um, I would say to scale down, um, you know, you have to be you have to make hard decisions around what type, not just like here I'm gonna take a, a head count here and a head count there and like kind of cut across your functions. At that point you probably have to make strategic decisions about what parts of businesses you don't pursue and shut down entire teams. You know, if you're truly in like a massive scale down mode, that's how I would look at it. Thank you. Can I follow up on that which is slow, uh, hiring slowly. Most founders don't have the luxury of going slow, especially if you're just starting to pick up, right? How do you manage that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, uh, quote, slow is a, is a relative term. Um, I'm not suggesting it takes you a year to hire somebody, although for some roles it may take that long. I would suggest that it is much more painful for you to hire fast but the wrong person because you're gonna spend a lot of time, a lot of money in hiring that person. That person's gonna ramp up. You're gonna introduce a lot of disruption into your organization. And if that person doesn't provide value for you in the first you know, three to six months, then you gotta churn that person out. It's gonna take you another three months to turn that person out. You've already lost a year there. Uh, yeah. And you refer to a framework. If you have a framework, it can make it easier. Yeah, I think the framework, you know, start out with what the role is, what, what's the objective for that role, um, then I would obviously have kind of your skill set, you know, do they check the boxes here? But then I, w I tend to over-rotate on more of the values aspect of a, of a person versus sk the skills aspect. I'm going to make the assumption that by the time you get to this, this role, you already have, you know, whatever subject matter expertise that you need, right? But to me, it's the values alignment has to be there. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, could you please uh, give some insights to what the healthy relationships between uh, 
let's say, CLLs and uh, co-founders or uh, boards of directors who is investing in a company. What kind of good habits, what kind of maybe good frameworks you can advise? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question again? So uh, we have C-level uh, executives in the company and we have board of directors. So what you would advise to C-levels to build healthy relationships with board of directors, what kind of things they need to pay attention and keep under their control? Okay, how do you build effective relationship with C-level in, with and, the, board. in the board? Um, good question. So I've had experience managing boards and I'm on a, two different boards. Um, I think that, oh, it's such a tricky question. I think you want to be, you want to make sure that you're looking at everything from a board point of view. So what do they care about, right? A board for a startup is different from a board for larger companies. Um, a board for a startup, you're probably looking at basically your investors, right? Investors, they're not there out of charity, right? They're there to want your businesses to grow really, really fast. And so I would say be very, um, be open about sharing about your business. Make sure that you're bringing them along in the good and bad of your business. As a board member, the last thing you want is to be brought into an issue after everything's already hit the fan, right? You don't want to, you, you want to start, you want to share the good and the bad, right? So you want to always make sure you're, you're bringing like, here's my wins, um, and then here's where I'm really having a challenge in my business. The reason why you want to do that is because when you are sharing what's challenging in your business, you are building trust because nothing ever goes right in life. That's just not realistic. And when you're able to, to share what's, what's challenging, A, they have a heads up. B, they can help you. Everyone wants to be helpful if they know how to help. And by sharing very specific things about what's going wrong, you, they, you can ask for help in a very direct way. Um, so I would say, you know, look at everything from your board's, board's perspective. What do they want it out of the relationship? And, um, and be transparent on what's going well. And, but more importantly, where they, you can use their help. Who, who on the C level is the bridge, the most effective bridge to the board? Uh, it, it would be the CEO, yeah. Um, right when pandemic was starting to happen, and a lot of companies were getting into trouble, our board, in fact, um, you know, went through the same hard process. And uh, Brad Felt, who's a, one of our co-founders, um, and David Cohn, who's the chairman, they actually made a statement about this in terms of how Techstars was able to navigate that hardship very effectively and what they meant by how our C-level executed. And one of the things they point out, because they're also on the board of many startups, big major startups, because he's founder of a group, which is a big investment fund. And he was saying exactly that, which is as soon as things start getting hard, many inexperienced C-level people will kind of you know, get scared and then hide a lot of information or withhold, try to fix things before they go to the board. But what had happened with the good ones, including Techstars, they said was, we're very extra communicative, proactive, asking for help, updating them on a regular basis. And that helped us navigate that difficulty and have both sides on the same page, et cetera, right? So that extra communication yeah, so the, the, in the pandemic example, the board I'm on in the U.S., it's a, it's a furniture business, and obviously everyone was, in the very beginning of, of COVID, everyone was unsure what would happen. Um, we as a board were on an hour and a half call with the management team every single week for about six months um, just to make sure that we are understanding the actions that they're taking. And as a result, you know, we, we have incredible trust in the leadership and the management team, and that company has outperformed the market. Not necessarily because of those calls, but, um, you know, I mean, they're just kind of an extraordinary management team to begin with, and that's why they manage that communication so well. I noticed that until the executive team is sort of professional and external, the original team 
almost most of the time doesn't use their board as well. Most companies is what I notice. They just kind of keep them up there, you know, take the money and do the quarterly thing, but never go proactively for asking for help and like, you know, sharing and doing. All. Yeah, I generally find that you like, you don't ask, you don't get, right? I think people generally want to help, but you have to be very specific about your ask because even people who are really helpful want to be helpful. They don't really have that much time, right? Generally, the people you want to ask for help are going to be successful, busy people, and so therefore they're star fun time. And so you have to be like, can you connect me with this specific person? You know, here's an intro email. I'm just going to forward it to you, so it takes you no time to do something. Um, that's how I would I would go about it. And the last thing I'll say is Brad Felt I think wrote a book on how to be an effective board member, and what I learned is it's it's a different job, isn't it? So being a C-level person is one job. Being on a board and good board member is a whole another job. So I think we need to learn to do that. I'm not a very good board member yet. So, All right, any other questions? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned B2C starters before. So how, uh, in the previous environments, the capital was cheap. So it's, it was easier for companies to raise money, spend it on marketing, customer acquisition, etc. So I think two questions here. How have you seen the progression? Currently, where it's very hard to raise uh, huge rounds for B2C startups, uh, you, you mostly see AI startups raising a lot of money to cover NVIDIA costs or uh, AMD costs. So how have you seen the progression currently in the B2C environment? What experiences you've seen in, in real uh, case, uh, cases from startups on how they adapted to the current environment? And maybe also you mentioned you're on two boards of B2C companies. How does the metric change? So if before it was mostly gross at all costs, is it more now on prof profitability, new markets, new products? How have you seen also in terms of metrics, uh, both in startups and scale-ups? Yeah, I mean, we're now really kind of living in the real world, and for the past 10 years in a zero interest rate environment, we're not really living in a real world, right? And so you're finding companies even at Series A with VC saying like, hey, what's your EBITDA? Where like three years ago, that would have never been the case. Three years ago, it's like, all right, how many customers can you, it was like very top of the funnel. Um, and so, that, I mean, that's obviously the trend also for the trend for B2C companies is to cut as much as you can, extend your runway and focus on the unit economics of your business. And so the, com the companies that aren't going to make it are the ones who had faulty business models to begin with, right? And so when they say like, hey, this is the time where you're gonna build the next great set of companies, it's because the next great set of great companies are built on real, business fundamentals, ones where their, their operating model actually works. Um, there's another part of question I'm not addressing because it was a multi-part question. Yeah. Um, B2C companies, if you are at the earlier stage, um, you know, seed level is it's still quite open as you get to more um, like let's say C to D more um, growth stage. It becomes much harder to raise. Um, I think the prevailing sentiment is that there is a um, cleanup, if you will, that is still to come. If your unit economics at the C, or sorry, at the C or D stage isn't working, it's going to be it's very very hard for you to raise money right now. Okay, one last question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it's very difficult to generate heat in two-sided marketplaces. And I'm building a two-sided marketplace, <laughs> mainly like a rent the runway, but peer-to-peer. -peer. And we're starting to uh, we're serv service hundreds of ladies already and just starting to grow. What would be, as, a, as someone who has led the operations at Lyft, what's the strategy or the blueprint into scaling uh, such business? And if there's one strategy that you think is the most like, effective in scaling, what would it be? Okay, so peer-to-peer, um, -peer, kind of rent the runway type of place. Yes. Um, okay, interesting. Um, operations for your business is probably going to be really complex, is what I'm assuming. Um, kind of quality assurance and return logistics is probably going to be, I don't know if you're taking returns, but that's probably pretty complex. Um, what's one way to scale? Um, I think that I would be super constrained. To, so this is where you would go slow to go fast. I think that you probably want to be very specific around the geographic region that you want to you know, build that heat 
heat energy map. Um, and you may want to be very specific about uh, the type of product or brands or apparel. I'm just assuming it's apparel because it's Rent the Runway. I would be very specific about that. Build a niche of people who are to be really crazy about your product. Let's say it's handbags, right? So build, you, you make it up. You only service these five brands and kind of build the build a story around why you're the best in these five brands in this specific area. And once you're able to be successful in that, then start expanding out. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, get what you can at this stage, right? I wouldn't just sign anyone up because they're like, oh, I have a closet full of stuff I want to sell. I would be very, very discernible about um, staking your place in the ground to say, I'm only operating in this geography and I'm only doing this category in these brands. Focus. Focus. <laughs> Focus. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shirley, for your Thank time. You. Thank you for joining us today, and see you guys around. Please say hi to her. Yeah. Thanks for coming.